push forward with Lost Art Press. A lot of the times when we discuss our books on our website, we give you a lot of the technical terms and mechanical specifications for our books. And I hear a lot from readers that generally they have no idea what we're talking about when we discuss these. So today I wanted to give you a really brief introduction to some of the mechanical aspects of books. Some of the stuff that we do, some of the stuff other publishers do, so that you can figure out if the books on your bookshelf are going to last one year, two years, or maybe even a hundred years. So let's start with the first and most important aspect of every book, and that's the paper. So one of the things you, you see a lot when it comes to paper is they talk about the paper weight. Is a lot of times I'll have hashtag 100, which doesn't mean a hipster thing. It means that it's a 100-pound paper. Well, what does a 100-pound paper mean? Well, paper is measured in the number of pounds per 500 sheets, or ream of paper. So this is uh, 500 sheets of copy paper, and you put it on the scale, and it weighs 5 pounds. So would you say this is 5-pound paper? No, it's actually 20-pound paper because a sheet of paper in the printing industry is actually 17 by 22, which is four times the size of this one sheet. So if you pick up uh, pop, copy paper at your staples or wherever, and it says 20 pound paper, when you pick up four of them, that should be 20 pounds. So basically, the bigger the number, the heavier the paper. Now, paper weight is tricky. It's not always heavier. Heavier is not always better. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Is that sometimes uh, really heavy paper can be difficult to, uh, to use. It can be difficult to manipulate. It can be difficult to turn in a book. So you need to pick the right paper weight for the application, for the size of the book, for the type of the book. Uh, we try to go for paper that is not easy to tear and is easy to turn and will take ink very readily. There are lots of other different aspects to paper, but one of the most important things that relates to reading it is whether or not it's coded. And you know, we'll be going through our uh, paper uh, uh, paper samples here when we're trying to decide on a different kind of paper. And you're going to see that some papers are going to be really shiny, and some are going to be really dull, really matte, um, uncoded paper which we sometimes use, is just that. It has no coating on it. So in a book such as Make a Joint Stool from a Tree, you're going to open it up and you're going to see uncoated and pretty much undyed what we call natural paper. So if we look at the interior of Make a Joint Stool from a Tree, uh, you can see that it's a very matte experience and uh, it's not this ultra white uh, paper. The advantage to this is I think it's really quite easy on the eyes. Uh, to, it's quite easy to read, it has a uh, nice texture, and uh, feels, I don't know if the right word is old, but it just uh, it has an older feel to it. Um, the downside to uh, uncoated uh, paper is that it really soaks up the ink. And so sometimes you're not going to get text or pictures that are just quite as crisp as you would uh, with coated paper. Uh, you can, of course, manage all this on press, as we've done here, and if you get a very high-quality uh, printing job, you can get very vibrant colors uh, and, uh, and pretty crisp text. text. Uh, coated paper can be uh, coated with a variety of things, but generally it's clay. Uh, some people will grind up seashells or talc and use it to coat the paper. And it will do a lot of different things. Uh, so this is uh, seashell coated paper. And uh, it's, it's not an extremely glossy coating. We don't use glossy coatings because I find them to be very reflective and that uh, reduces readability. Uh, the nice thing about coated paper is it will make the paper really smooth uh, to the touch. And if you want sort of a high-end uh, art book kind of feel, you're going to want uh, coated paper. It also will make the text very crisp and it will make it very easy, especially with uh, paper that's white, to dial in the colors uh, when you're trying to deal with something like paintings or the color of wood or, or something like that. So uh, coated paper is definitely 
uh, something we lean on quite a bit. We do use uncoated paper for some things. I wouldn't say that one is better than the other. It's just a matter of what the book uh, demands. While we're on the topic of paper, let's talk about one interesting aspect of it that we use only on this book, The Art of Joinery. And that's what we call a deckle edge. And that's when the paper has this rough edge on the right, uh, the right edge of it. And this deckle edge means that uh, they just didn't cut the book block. So after the, uh, the pages were assembled, they uh, left it uh, with the rough paper edge, which gives this book a very nice vintage look uh, to it. Some people don't like it. I, I kind of like it. Uh, the big downside to a deckle edge, and the reason we don't use it very much, is because you are limited in the types of bindings that you can use with a deckle edge. You have to use basically a glue binding, a glue and tape binding, and you can't sew the pages together. And so uh, that's one of the reasons we don't use this binding very often, but it also gets us into the next uh, and second most important aspect of a book and its durability, and that is the binding. So when you talk about binding, uh, there are so many kinds of binding to discuss that we could spend all day doing it, but we're just going to talk about the most important aspects of binding for uh, book binding. And the first thing is you can work with pages that are in signatures, or you can work with uh, pages that are just like uh, coming off of a photocopier. And what we do is we use what are called signatures. So what happens is you have, imagine this is a big sheet of paper that has gone through a press and it's been printed on both sides and so what we have here actually are uh, 16 pages of the book so there are eight on this side and eight on this side and then a folder will fold all this together and this represents a 16 page signature this will be then affixed to other uh, 16 page signatures and then the uh, book block will be trimmed all around and then you'll have 16 pages of, of text and that is, uh, the, the, I think, the right way to do it. The wrong way to do it is uh, what is used in inexpensive um, print-on-demand applications and inexpensive trade paperbacks. Here, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, if you look right here at where the spine of the book is, it's just a stack of basically uh, photocopied pages or offset printed pages that have been sunk into some hot melt glue with a cover that's been ironed on uh, onto the book block. Uh, this will last two or three readings. You might get four or five good years out of this book, but as the pages get opened and closed repeatedly, this glue binding is going to weaken, and what's going to happen is individual pages are going to fall out of the book. The book's just going to self-destruct. Uh, not a good plan for, uh, uh, for longevity. And so this is what you'll see with cheap paperbacks and what we call print-on-demand books. Let's talk about a form of binding that's a little better than just gluing pages together. This is sometimes called perfect binding, and that's when you actually have signatures, and if you look closely here, you can see those little folded up sections all stacked on top of each other that are then buried into a bunch of glue with the cover ironed on. Uh, this is a fairly sturdy way to build a paperback or a nice magazine. You'll see nice magazines that use perfect binding as well. A uh, uh, paperback like this can last you many years. Uh, I've had them last 20 years or more, and that's because of that thick backbone of the, uh, uh, of the signatures. So let's talk about what we think is the best kind of binding, which is sometimes called addition binding. And that's when you take all your signatures, uh, and so we have signatures just like we did before with the paperback and the perfect binding, but then we take a thread and we sew all these signatures together and add glue. So if you want, if you can't quite see the thread, uh, let's get in really tight here and you can see what that looks like. So here you can see, kind of behind the glue, a little rows about every five-eighths of an inch. And this is thread 
that has been passed through all the signatures and gets looped around up and down. There are lots of different kinds of sewing patterns. Uh, the most common one you might have heard of is called Smith or Smythe sewing. And it costs just a little bit extra to run this th thread through the signatures. But this is what makes sure that a book is going to survive babies, floods, and dogs. And that's why we, we do it on every book. Now, after you get that thread through all of your signatures, you uh, generally will put some glue on it and then uh, some fiber tape. So here you can see this is one of our book blocks for joiner and cabinet maker and has been deconstructed. And so after all that's sewn, then we put this fiber tape on the outside and the fibrous tape attaches to the end sheets. And so this, these are separate from the signatures and they're glued into the front and into the back and they work like a hinge. And the way that goes together is here we have a uh, kind of destroyed uh, cover, but then this end sheet is glued to the cover. And back here, this end sheet is glued to the cover. And that's how you make a hardbound book. So let's talk about the case for a little bit. And uh, the case is what goes on the outside of the book block. And when it is hardcover, we call that being case bound. And the most important aspect of a case bound book are the boards. Now these used to be wood, obviously, and that's why they're called boards. Uh, now they're a cardboard or composite material, something more like MDF. Um, like MDF and wood is this board can respond to moisture. And so the thickness of the board can affect the quality of the book. Right now, we use the thickness of a board that's called 98-point board, which is a fairly thick board. Before, we used to use a slightly thinner board, but we found that with changes in moisture content uh, in the room, uh, the, the board would curl up a little bit and then curl back down when the moisture changed. So we switched to a heavier board. didn't cost a lot, but because we knew a little bit about moisture content, we knew to switch to a heavier board. So let's talk about some of the other details that you can uh, do in a, a book. Uh, as I showed you with the end sheets, uh, you can use white end sheets. This is a pretty standard thick, heavy end sheet to affix the book block to your boards. Or you can use uh, different colored end sheets uh, that are heavier, that are textured, that are uh, glitterified, uh, pretty much dignified, uh, stupefied, whatever you want, uh, there are end sheets available, or you can go whole hog. And with some books, uh, such as Chairmaker's Notebook, we used uh, printed end sheets. So this is that same hinge that is bound to the front of the book block, pasted in to the board. But as you can see, we printed images uh, from Peter Galbert's book here in the front and in the back all of the plans uh, for the two chairs that are in the book. So you can really go nuts uh, and spend a lot of money uh, with, with end sheets, and it's a nice touch. It doesn't really affect the quality or the reading experience necessarily. A couple other things uh, to look for when you're looking at your books and you're trying to decide if it's a quality book or not is what's called the fore edge. And the fore edge is simply this, uh, kind of like the reveal of a cabinet, how much of the cover or the boards stick out over the book block? And is that fore edge consistent or not? Uh, you usually want about an eighth of an inch. Sometimes uh, inferior uh, printers will have a really big fore edge out here and a really skinny fore edge out here. It's just something to look for to, to know if the, uh, the person knows what they're talking about. Uh, the other thing you can see that is an important aspect of the case is the cloth, the cover cloth. We use 100% cotton cloth uh, called pearl linen. And you have a variety of choices of colors. It's like picking out your animals, And so uh, they change year by year. And we were very excited, for example, when they finally got the color mud pie. And we were able to use that in, in campaign furniture. But these change slightly uh, every year. And uh, the cover cloth uh, 
uh, can be plastic. You'll see that really often, and uh, they're trying to make it look like leather. We just sort of uh, uh, stick with cotton. Uh, the final detail on the case is what we call the die stamp. And uh, we have a die stamp on practically all of our books. And this is a very primitive process where they make a metal uh, die, usually like out of zinc or copper, uh, depending on how much money you want to spend. And uh, that gets inked and then the image gets debossed into uh, the, the cover. And we think a die stamp is important because dust jackets are not forever. Uh, die stamps are. So we do put a lot of effort into that, and it's another thing that costs money, but make sure that the book is nice for years to come. One last detail here of the case. Uh, this is kind of like your gill slits. Uh, this is a vestigial organ of uh, printing. A lot of people look at this, uh, these threads up here, which are called the headbands, uh, sometimes called the headbands and the footbands. And uh, people say, oh, well, that is clearly an example that this binding has been sewn. Well, that's crap. Uh, this is just a little piece of cloth that is glued in at the top and the bottom. It might provide a little bit of durability when you uh, bonk the corner of the book against something hard. I kind of doubt that, but mostly it's just a nice little touch. Uh, we like to use contrasting headbands, which is where we actually pick a thread color uh, that matches our board or is uh, in sympathy with the board with a uh, contrasting uh, thread. There's no limit to the amount of minute details you can get into with publishing, just like woodworking. As most of you know, we print all of our books in the United States, and we hear from a lot of customers that say, yeah, that's great, go USA, and uh, Chinese manufacturing and overseas manufacturing, it really sucks. Uh, that's just not the case, I'm afraid. Um, after a lifetime spent in commercial printing, I can tell you that the quality of Chinese printing and Korean printing is some of the best, if not the best, in the world. Uh, the prices are better, uh, the quality is absolutely outstanding, and the service is, is, is top notch. Uh, the reason we print in the United States uh, is that uh, there are several reasons. One, we like to support our neighbors. I think that's always important. Um, two, the time to market is a lot faster. While uh, ordering something from a Chinese printer can take you six months to land it in San Francisco, we can usually turn books around in five weeks. Um, and then uh, the third reason is that it's a challenge to print here in the United States. Uh, we are always working with uh, domestic printers to try to all of us, get all of us to bring up our quality and, uh, and do a better job. So the next time somebody uh, tells you uh, something crappy about Chinese and Chinese printing, uh, don't believe it. It's really good. Uh, but there are just as many reasons to print here domestically that are good for us. And I hope that you will uh, take all this information about uh, book publishing and book details and be able to evaluate the books in your collection and the books that you decide to add to it uh, in the days to come.